18. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 30 as you're turning there. I will say that we have just a few more Sundays of Jesus' teachings in Luke, and then when we get over into Luke 22, we're going to pick up the pace. Uh, we get back into the narrative, the very familiar narrative. So we're going to cover chapters 22, 23, and 24 pretty quickly. So there is the end in sight if you're, if you're tired of Luke. There's, there is the end in sight. Uh, this morning we're in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. And I know that this is a familiar passage of Scripture. And when we get to a familiar passage of Scripture, a lot of times we scan over it, we read it, we know it, we think we can move on from it. But I want us to consider four questions from this text this morning. I want us to consider four questions that we need to ask ourselves and that we need to answer honestly. And then if we answer those questions, if the Lord should move on our hearts to see a need for a change as we walk through those four questions, then we're going to see seven points of application uh, before we leave here today. So as I said, buckle up. This is a passage of Scripture that when we walk through it uh, probably will not leave anyone extremely excited um, about what you hear, but this is truth, and these are the words of Jesus, and we need to consider these this morning. And we don't need to just consider them in a way to check off our boxes to say we heard the sermon, we follow along with the outline, but we need to really wrestle with the things that we're going to see in this text, practically speaking. And that's going to get into our business. So let's look at this together. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse number 18. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, as he often does, sidesteps the question and asks his own question, unrelated to the question in some ways. And Jesus said to him in verse 19, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Now he gets to the question. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He just gives him a snapshot of the Ten Commandments, which we've all broken, every one of them. Remember, there's no one good. And he said, the ruler said in verse 21, All these things I have kept from my youth, which was not true, especially if he had listened to the Sermon on the Mount and had heard how Jesus took those commandments that applied to the outward, and he took those commandments and applied them to the inward, and to the heart. But nonetheless, he says, I've kept them. And Jesus doesn't deal with that in verse 22. When he hears this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Let's just presume you're right. And you've kept all the commandments. One thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. Which is exactly what we see many in the early church doing in Acts chapter 2. They sold their possessions, they sold their lands, they gave it away as others had need. It says, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Verse 28, Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. Four questions that we need to ask ourselves as we look at this passage of Scripture. And should God show us in our hearts where we're off base, seven points of application that we can wrestle through as we seek to be obedient to Christianity and what Christ teaches. First question that we need to answer this morning 
Yes, even as we gather in this place professing to be Christians, professing to know our Bibles, we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus good or is he God? Is Jesus good or is he God? Verses 18 and 19, the ruler questioned Jesus saying, he's questioning Jesus by addressing him as good teacher. Good teacher. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So the, the, young, the rich young man, the, the rich ruler, comes to Jesus and he, he addresses him as the good teacher. The good teacher. And that's much of what our society would want to say about Jesus. That they believe Jesus is a good teacher. But Jesus stops him and responds with a question of his own. Are you saying that I'm God? Don't misunderstand what Jesus is asking. Jesus isn't saying, I'm not good, no one's good. Why on earth would you claim that I'm good? That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, are you calling me God? Are you professing that I am God in the flesh because no one is really good but God and you just said I was good? So do you think I'm God? And here's what we need to understand this morning. Jesus is either God or Jesus is not good. Jesus is either God or Jesus is not good. He cannot be one without the other. In the words of C.S. Lewis, I am trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut Jesus up as a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If you've read the commands of Jesus and the claims of Jesus, you cannot say that Jesus is just a good teacher, that Jesus is just a moral teacher. He is either God or he is not good. Now, what does that have to do with us this morning? There is a big difference because if Jesus is just good, hear me, if Jesus is just good, we can look to Jesus for advice. Which is what many of us who claim to be Christians do. Here's a decision set before me. Let's say with how we handle our finances. Which is what this whole story is about this morning. Here, here, here's a question setting before me of how I handle my finances. I go to Jesus for advice. I don't care for his advice. So I do it Dave Ramsey's way. Or fill in any other financial guru's way that you want to come up with. Or my way. Or the American culture's way. Or my parents' way. Or my grandparents' way. I don't like Jesus' advice here. It doesn't really apply to our context. I mean, of course, Jesus couldn't be speaking to us here in, a, in America, right? 21st century America. So I don't like that advice. I'm going to do this. When we do that, we treat Jesus like a good teacher. Not like God. But if Jesus is God, we must look to him for total leadership in our lives. Even if that means going against everything our affluent culture and maybe even our religious neighbors might tell us to do and that might tell us is dignified. 
But if Jesus is God, we do not have the right to say to him, not today, Jesus, I don't think that fits my life. If he is God and if he is Lord, we don't go to him for advice. We go to him for commands. And we don't have the option to choose whether this is right for me or not. We just say, yes, Lord, yes, Master. So this is a pretty provocative question we need to answer. It's a pretty important question we need to answer this morning. Is Jesus good or is Jesus God? Because if he is God, he will change everything. Second question we need to ask and answer. Do I lack one thing? Do I lack one thing among all my possessions? Look in verses 20 to 22. You know the commandments, Jesus says. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. It's as if Jesus were to look at us today and say, how are you doing? And we say, well, you know, I read my Bible, I pray, I make it to Sunday school by 9.05. I sit through the sermon. I take some notes. I'm a good moral person. I give a tithe. And everybody around us is applauding. And Jesus looks at us and says, as he said to the young ruler in verse 22, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Do I lack one thing? There's two common errors people make in this passage. The first common error that people sometimes make in this passage is some try to universalize Jesus' words here in this text saying that he always commands all of his followers to sell all of their possessions and give all of the proceeds away to the poor. So they read this and they say, this applies to every person who claims to be a Christian. You need to go sell everything you have and give everything away. And we know that this is not true. We can't universalize this. This was specifically for a rich ruler, a young ruler who came to Jesus. We know that Lydia, a seller of purple, had a home large enough for the church to meet in. We know that some women went along with Jesus and they were contributing to his ministry and to the disciples' ministry. So they have something. So that we can't universalize this command. And some of you are going, Whew. But the other error is to assume that Jesus never calls his followers to abandon all of their possessions to follow him. Robert Gundry wrote this, that Jesus did not command all his followers to sell all their possessions, gives comfort only to the kind of people to whom he would issue that command. Do I need to read that one more time just for effects? That Jesus did not command all his followers to sell all their possessions gives comfort only to the kind of people to whom he would issue that command. This is a question we have to ask ourselves. If Jesus were to corner us this morning and to look at our lives and to look into our hearts, would we lack one thing? In Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, which we've already covered, you should know this by heart, right? Jesus said, any one of you who does not renounce, and that Greek word there for renounce is apostasso, which is, which is a say goodbye to. All that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, here is something that Jesus does universalize. Leave that up there. 
He may not universalize what he told the, the young ruler in Luke chapter 18, sell all that you have and give to the poor. But here, he definitely does universalize everything because he says any one of you, any person sitting in the sanctuary at First Baptist Church, Tullahoma, or watching by live stream, any one of you that does not say goodbye to all that he has cannot be my disciple. Should we go ahead and open the altars up for response at this time? Does anyone want to come follow Jesus this morning? Listen, we have created our own brand of Christianity in America where we can live just like the lost pagan down the street and tack on some Jesus onto our lives, go to church on Sunday and claim to be a Christian. Jesus does not allow that. He leaves no room for that. He comes to us and he says, do you want to follow me? Repeat this little prayer after me. Mean it in your heart. Get baptized. Join the church and be a good American. That's not what he says. He says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you open up your hand and you release your grip on every single thing you have in your life and you be willing to say goodbye to it now. Does that mean he takes it away? Sometimes. Sometimes. Does he mean he leaves things with us? Sometimes. But it definitely means you better have your hand open or you better not claim to be a Christian. There's a song. We lie it. We lie it. I mean, we sing it. <clears throat> I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I Surrender all. That, I'm convinced, is the definition of the Christian life. In Mark's gospel, we see the same story. With one slight difference. In Mark's gospel, we find that when Jesus looked at this young ruler... He loved him. That's what Mark's gospel says. When Jesus looked at him, he loved him. And this is very important for us to see this morning because this lets us know that this counsel that Jesus gives the rich young ruler was not given to punish him. It was not given as some type of penance. Well, you've lived it up this long, buddy. Now you need to suffer to pay your dues so that you can be a real Christian. No, Jesus is not telling him to do penance. Jesus is not trying to punish him or discipline him. Jesus looks at him in love, and he wants what is good for this young man. And what is good and what is best for this young man is to release his grip on everything he has and come follow Jesus. This is not punishment. This is not even sacrifice. This is not even sacrifice. This is an invitation to make an investment that guarantees eternal return. If you drop down to verses 28 to 30, Peter, of course Peter, you know, he's going to voice what everybody in the room is thinking. Peter says, Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. We've left our fishing nets. We've left our boats. We've left our homes. We've left our businesses and followed you. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one, not one person, who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. This is not punishment. This is good. And this is love. Is Jesus good or is Jesus God? Do you, do I... Do we lack one thing? Number three. Do I qualify as having wealth? Now, some of you are thinking, well, this is an easy one. It actually is very easy. Verse 23. When he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely 
rich. So maybe I should re-ask this question another way. Instead of do I qualify as having wealth, do I qualify as being extremely rich? That makes it a little better, right? Do I qualify as being extremely rich like this young man? I know that many of us may not believe that we live in luxury. Our tendency when we think about the rich, especially the extremely rich, is to think about those people. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those kind of people. But I want you to think about this. And I want you to listen to me carefully. Over one billion people who are alive and live their lives. Over one billion people live their lives on less than one dollar a day. I've seen it. I've seen the little kid sent out with the quarter or the 50 cents to chase the platino wagon down the road to try to get just enough plantains to get through the day. One billion people live on less than one dollar a day. Almost two billion more live on less than two dollars a day. It's three billion people on planet Earth, roughly, that live on two dollars or less a day. One billion live on a dollar a day or less, and two billion live on two dollars a day or less. Thirty-seven percent of the world, thirty-seven percent of the world makes less than eight hundred and twenty-five dollars a year. Eighty-four percent of the world's population. Eighty. 4% of the world's population makes less than $10,000 a year. Did you know that? 84% of the world's population makes less than $10,000 a year. That means if you make more than $10,000 a year right now, you are in the top 16% of the richest people on planet Earth. If you happen to make 42000 or more, that puts you in the top two and a half percent of the richest people on planet Earth. Now when we stand before God, as some of the richest people on planet Earth, do you think he's going to say, well, I know the people in your town, you know, they lived on much, much, much more so spend it up, use it up, love it up, live it up. You know, it's okay because that's where you were born and that's the standard of your culture. You know, you get a pass. Or is he going to say, out of the entire world, I made you one of the most extremely rich people on the planet. Now what did you do with it? Well, 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 Lord, you know, I had to have designer clothes. Well, well, Lord, I had to have a brand new vehicle every year too. Lord, I had to have a bigger, bigger, better, and bigger and better home. Lord, I had to have a new this and a new that and everything that comes across the commercials because I was caught up in this world. And Lord, I know you're going to understand that. We may not be some of the filthiest rich people on an Ameri in an American context, but we are extremely, extremely wealthy in the world's context. Which context do you think Jesus is going to be looking at us from when, he, when we stand before him at the end of time? Do I qualify as being extremely rich? Which leads to the fourth question. What must I do to be saved from the American dream? Verses 24 to 27, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Jesus is telling us it is hard for us to get to heaven. If we're extremely wealthy, he just said it's hard for us to get to the kingdom. It's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for me to get into the kingdom of heaven. That, is, that should scare us to death right now. That should terrify us. If you're, if you're sitting there and you're like, well, pfft, I, mean, I know the preacher's in a rant right now. We're just going to, I mean, I know what I've always believed. You may have always believed you're a polka dot poodle, but you're not one. You may have always believed you could fly if you jumped out of an airplane at 30,000 feet, but you can't. And you may believe, you may believe that it's easy for you to get into the kingdom because you were born and raised in the Bible Belt and you grew up in church. So what if you're extremely rich? Well, let me just tell you, Jesus said, and he knows what he's talking about, that it's hard. So we might need to ask ourselves this morning, what must I do to be saved from this American dream? Are we enjoying this yet? I'm just preaching it as it comes. It just happened to come after a week I was off. The American dream is this. You know what the American dream is, right? Get all you can, can all you get, then sit on the can so you can enjoy your golden years, travel the globe, have a good time. That's it. The American dream is get all you can, sit on the can, so that you can retire and enjoy your golden years. And we think of this as being blessed. After all, God blesses those who follow him and live holy lives and, and walk in wisdom, doesn't he? Well, that's rooted in Old Covenant. That's an Old Covenant concept. The Old Testament is pretty clear. You obey, you get blessings. You don't obey, you get judgment. You obey, you get the land flowing with milk and honey. You disobey, you get rooted out of the land. But listen, we live under the rule not of Israel, not of David, but of Jesus, the final David. And we live in the New Covenant. Craig Bloomberg wrote, The New Testament carried forward the major principles of the Old Testament and the intertestamental Judaism. In other words, the New Testament brings along with it the major principles of the Old Testament with one conspicuous omission. One thing seems to be missing. Never was material wealth promised as a guaranteed reward for either spiritual obedience or even simple hard work. Material reward for piety never reappears in Jesus' teaching and is explicitly contradicted throughout. What he's saying is, when we enter to the new covenant and we begin to follow Jesus, then we will be hated like he was hated. We will be persecuted like he was persecuted. We will suffer like he suffers. We're not promised a bed of roses regardless of what a TV preacher tells us. You know how the TV preacher got the bed of roses? Not from God, but from gullible people who worship money, who send him money, hoping they're going to get rich like he is. It's just a big money-worshiping scheme. But Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Nor did most of his disciples. Are our blessings even, even blessings? We're fine with thinking of affluence, comfort, and material possessions as blessings. But could they be barriers? Jesus in Luke 16, 13 says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other. He'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. That sounds more like a barrier than a blessing. 1 Timothy 6, 9-10, through 10, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. What a blessing into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That does not sound like a blessing to me. 
In light of these verses, could it be possible, could it be possible that the American dream is more like a spiritual nightmare? Could it be possible that our possessions are subtly, subtly deadly, blinding our eyes to what really matters and to real needs around the globe? I have a good friend who's in ministry, and he flew to Louisville, Kentucky to go to a conference up there. I think it was Together for the Gospel a few years, several years back, and he calls an Uber driver or taxi that the guy pulls up, my pastor friend gets in the back seat of the taxi, and they begin driving to uh, the, the stadium or the venue where the conference was being held. The guy driving is an Iranian. And my pastor friend's in the back seat, and he's thinking about how he's going to try to share the gospel with this Iranian guy. And all of a sudden, the Iranian guy says, So, do you know David Platt? My pastor friend says, Well, uh, I don't know him, but I know who he is. You going to the conference? Well, yeah, I'm, I, that's where I'm headed. I'm planning to go to the conference. I know David Platt. Really? Yes. He came, he came to a neighboring country years ago, and I would cross the border and go hear him teach in the caves at night as he did his Bible studies there. So I surrendered to the ministry and came to America. He said, I had to flee my country. I had to cross uncharted territory. I had to go through a refugee system. I had to go through many trials and tribulations to escape death in my country, imprisonment in my country, to get to this country, to go to seminary at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary here in Louisville. My pastor friend's just elated. He's like, this is amazing. And then he says, but I think I'm going to quit and go back to Iran. And he says, quit and go back to Iran? Why would you do that? And he said, it's too dangerous here. And my pastor friend says, too dangerous here. You just told me you had to flee your country for your life. You had to cross uncharted territories. You had to go through uncertain situations and, and systems to get here to this country. And now you're wanting to go back. And he said, yes. In my country, all they can take is my life. But in this country, in this country, there are many, many temptations that try to dampen my soul. And it is too dangerous. So I think I will go back. If we just get our heads wrapped around the seriousness of eternity, we may not see these blessings as blessings to be kept. And when they're kept, we may see them as dangers. Okay. I have to finish because I can't leave you there. So... If you're utterly bored or you just need to go, you can walk out on me. I've, it's happened before. I promise. Just don't slam the door behind you. Like some people, when they walk out, they slam the door. Bam! So everybody knows they Slip out. Don't slam out. And we won't say a word about it. But I need to get through these because I don't want to leave you with nowhere to go, right? So we all stink. We're all rich. We're all going to hell. That's not what we're conveying here. <laughs> That's not the message we're trying to convey here. We want to wake ourselves up with these four questions and hopefully have God say, you know what? Check yourself, buddy. Now what do we do about it? I'm about to regurgitate to you seven points that a friend of mine put together in an article that I'll try to post at some point and give you some interpretation of these seven points, okay? Number one, here's some ways we can just wrestle with this and try to fight against our consumeristic Culture. One, do not buy anything that you cannot give away. Do not buy anything that you cannot give away. Jesus said in Luke 12, 33 to 30, 34, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
So what if our houses, our cars, our clothes, our toys, what if we bought those things only with a willingness to turn it loose at the least indication from God? Isn't that what the song says? I surrender all, except for my house, my car, my clothes, my stuff. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. There is never going to come a day when I stand before God and He looks at me and says, I wish you would have kept more for yourself. Number two, stay totally out of debt. Romans 13, 8, owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Is debt sin? No, but it is a product of the fall. For most of us, if not all of us, at the very least, if we were to get out of debt, that means we are going to have to change our lifestyles completely and maybe not live as high on the hog. For some of us, that means we're going to have to work hard to get out of debt. But that's a, a needed thing to say. Stay out of debt. Number three. I'm going through these quickly. In mercy. Number three. Save according to God's direction, but be willing to give it all away at His direction. Remember, number one, don't buy anything that you cannot give away. Don't save anything that you can't give away either. Save according to God's direction, but be willing to give it all away at His direction. If you're going to stay out of debt, you likely need to save and plan for the future so that when your car kicks the bucket, you don't have to go out and borrow money to buy another car. You've got some money set aside for the car. But you should save because you are prudent, not because you're greedy. Matthew 6, 19 to 20, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You should save with a willingness to give it all away at the slightest hint of God's direction. Maybe savings accounts aren't intended to be our resources. Maybe they're intended to be God's resources. Maybe savings accounts are intended to be resources for God's disposal, not ours. Number four, pray for others' needs only if you are willing to be the answer. Pray for others' needs only if you're willing to be the answer. Lord, we pray that you would supply these missionaries with everything they need. I know somebody over there has got something they need to give these guys. Move on their hearts, Lord, to give it to them. No. You don't pray for another's needs unless you're willing to be that answer. Proverbs 28, 27, Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. There was a circuit-riding preacher in the late 1800s by the name of Robert Sheffy, and he was a character who rode his horse all over the Appalachian Mountains trying to share the gospel and pastor these people in these cabins. His horse led him across rivers and across creeks and up mountains and saved his life one time. His horse was his best friend. His horse was his companion. His horse was the other part of their two-man discipleship team. His horse was his help. They ride up on a family one day. The family is in the process of moving. They're in the middle of nowhere. Their wagon is loaded. Their children are sitting in the wagon. Their horse is lying in the middle of the road dead. Robert Sheffy gets down on his knees after ministering to them and talking to them and says he's going to pray for God to give them guidance and wisdom on how to get another horse. And he sat down and he began to pray. And his prayer went, Lord, no. You wouldn't ask that, would you? Amen. And he got up and he took the saddle off of his horse. And he gave his horse to that family. And he walked away, weeping, carrying his saddle into town. Pray for others' needs, only if you're willing to be that answer. Number five, look for opportunities to give. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That is your New Testament tithe right there. I know we hang on to the 10%. That's Old Testament. We've got to give that 10% tithe. But the reality is if you add up all the tithes of the Old Testament, it's a lot more than 10%. And now we're New Testament. Now we have Jesus. Now we have the full knowledge that, that the Old Testament people didn't have, and our new tithe is give bountifully. 
Each one must give as he's made up his mind. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Look for opportunities to give. Number six, fight against covetousness. Why do I say fight against covetousness? Because you're going to have to fight if you're not going to be covetous. That's why it's the 10th commandment, because we covet. And our society is made to want, make us want to covet with every commercial, with every billboard, with every ad. It's to make you covet. Luke 12, 15, he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession. I could just preach on that all day long. I won't. Our lives don't consist in what you have. Ooh, I got me a new outfit and a new car, and I'm going to get out at church, and everybody's going to see me, and everybody's going to think I'm something, and everybody's going to ignore you and go on in the church. And you're going to go home all depressed and disappointed because you spent all your money on a new outfit and a new car that enough people did not notice. Why? Because that's not who you are. Your life doesn't consist in what you possess, but that's a whole other sermon. The point of this is, Jesus says, take guard, be on guard against all covetousness. He doesn't say certain areas of covetousness are okay. I understand. No, be on guard against it all because it will overtake us and it could cost us our soul. We can fight. How do we fight against covetousness? Turn off the TV, turn off all the ads. That would be one way. But another way we can do that as well is by setting a cap. We don't have to increase our standard of living every time we get a standard of living raise. John Wesley set a cap. He identified a modest level of expenses that he was going to live on every year, and he committed to give the rest away. At one point, John Wesley was making the equivalent of about $160,000 a year in today's money. But he was living as if he were making $20,000 a year in today's money. What if you and I had simple caps on our lifestyle and were free to give the rest of our resources away for the glory of Christ in the neediest parts of the world? I got a feeling we would, the only reason we would have a missionary problem is because we don't have enough people to put our money behind, not because we've got too many people who need our money to get behind them. If we just set a cap, a modest cap, Well, you know, I've got to live at a half million dollar standard. That's my cap. That's a ridiculous cap. Absolutely ridiculous. Modest cap. Set it. Stick to it. Give it. Give the rest away. Number seven, and lastly, strive. This is probably maybe the hardest one. Strive to be content with whatever God chooses to provide. 1 Timothy 6, 8. If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. It's a constant battle to resist the temptations to have more luxuries, to acquire more stuff, to move up the social ladder. It's a constant battle to resist the temptation to have to live in a certain type of house, drive a certain type of car, wear a certain type of clothing, have certain things. It's a constant battle to resist the temptation to pursue the bigger and the better house, a newer and a nicer car, more and nicer clothes, finer food, more stuff, fatter savings account, fatter investment accounts. It's a constant battle to live out the gospel in the middle of an amazing American church culture that for the most part is pursuing the American dream much more passionately than they're pursuing Christ in the nations. It's a battle to be content, so we must fight. Philippians 4, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not I can score the touchdown. I can hit the home run. It's I can suffer. I can abound. I can be poor. I can be rich. I can do it all through Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to end. No, 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 no. That's not where we need to end. That's where we need to begin. Right at the cross of Jesus Christ. So 
we can throw out all these facts and figures and hopefully, hopefully, get smacked right in the face with the reality this morning. But we have to run to Jesus as our starting point. And we have to keep going to Jesus and we have to end at Jesus because He is our only hope and He is our only help. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone. What is our only confidence? Christ alone. Christ alone. He is our only help this morning. So as we end this encouraging time together, I want you to be encouraged. And I want us to turn our attention to what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's there we can find forgiveness. It's there we can find forgiveness. It's there we can find mercy and grace. It's there this morning that we can find a brand new start. Start over financially. Start over as a steward. It's in Christ that we find that do-over that we so desperately all need. It's in Christ that we find that strength to fight against covetousness, to strive against this American nightmare that wants to suck us in and suck the life out of our souls. It's in Christ that we can open our hands and truly say, I surrender all to my blessed Savior because He loves me and He wants my good. So let's go to Jesus. If you would open that top little film, there's a piece of unleavened bread in that top film. It's round, it's unleavened, it's pure, it's leaven represents sin. It is to represent the reality that Jesus Christ is our unleavened bread. He is the one who came without sin, lived without sin, died without sin, reigns without sin, and who can make us without sin if we will just receive Him. That life-giving bread. Jesus came to this earth to live the sinless, spotless, perfect, righteous life that He requires us to live. Holy, pure, spotless, without blemish. And we can receive that today by turning from our sin and putting our faith and our trust in Him and receiving Him today and remembering what He's done for us as our Savior and as our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and for your love in sending us Christ, our unleavened bread, the bread of life, who came to live the life that you require of us, the sinless, spotless, perfect, holy life that you demand of us. We thank you that he lived it in our place and that he can put his sinless record on our accounts. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now if you'll open that bottom plastic, there's some juice which represents the fact that Jesus came to this earth not only to live the life God requires of us, but to shed His blood to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Listen. His blood is sufficient to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Our bad financial decisions, our bad stewardship decisions, He can cleanse that and wash it away this morning and give us a fresh start today. He can make you a new creation today because of His shed blood. And the Lamb of God who came to take away, not just cover up and hide away, but to take away, the sins of the world. Father, we thank you for Christ and for the fact that he shed his precious blood to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. God, help anyone here who's not experienced that cleansing to believe, to turn from their sin, to put their faith and their trust in you, to be washed, purified, and to be made a new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're going to stand. We're going to sing. Thank you for being with us this morning. If God has spoken to you, you need counsel, guidance, direction, please see someone that you trust, me, Andy, Tom, Brett, Michael, someone. We'll be glad to talk with you and to point you to Jesus. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. We'll be dismissed. And we never mention this, but I just feel like it's appropriate this morning to mention it because I never, ever mention it. But there are offering plates at each door. If you need to give this morning, you do that on your way out. Thank you.